Welcome to this video on evolution and strategy. This is lecture four in our series. This lecture will consider evolutionary psychology. So evolution has selected for disposition towards behaviors that increase an individual's fitness. There are four components to this natural selection. First of all, variation. A population of people has individuals who exhibit behavior A or behavior B. Selection. Behavior A tends to lead to higher fitness, remember that is survival, reproduction, and the ability to produce offspring that themselves can reproduce. So it leads to higher fitness than behavior B. Heritability. There's a genetic component that increases the likelihood of behavior. If we have variation, selection, and heritability, that will lead to evolution. The behaviors that cause Sorry, the alleles that cause the behavior increase in frequency within the population, and so the population will change and evolve this new behavior. Starting uh, to study evolutionary psychology, it is important to consider a warning. It's very easy to make up hypotheses to explain trends in behavior, but consistent explanations are not enough. We need to be able to test them in order to explain and justify those hypotheses. Otherwise, we run a risk of creating analogies and explanations that aren't much better than a just-so story. One challenging task is we need to be able to separate cultural factors and or upbringing from biological evolution. Consider this uh, hypothesis. Humans are afraid of spiders. Many humans show arachnophobia because they are poisonous. So this is an image of my son holding a tarantula here. A lot of people are afraid of spiders. Why are they afraid? Well, maybe that's because of our evolutionary history. But how do we separate that out? How do we separate out from, from upbringing? Let's say, for example, a child has seen their parent react to a spider. That might then instill in them a fear of spiders. Culture and upbringing has a significant impact on our viewpoint. If you take something, say, for example, like what body shape is considered attractive, that varies around cultures around the world and between individuals. Our upbringing and our culture has this, this significant impact. And so what might appear to be the case from one perspective um, quickly would be, uh, we see would be different. Um, from other cultures or people who brought up um, under different um, conditions. The best tests are going to be ones that are experiments involving unconscious decisions. These minimize conscious and cultural biases, and so we can uh, remove those from our test. We also want to consider comparisons that show universal patterns. These are minimizing culture-specific patterns. So is a particular behavior being shown all around the world between different cultures and societies? If so, that provides better evidence for evolutionary history. There are three components to fitness, remember. Survival, behaviors that improve mortality and health, we would expect to be favored. Reproduction, Behaviors that increase the chance of acquiring suitable mates will be favored. Offspring rearing, behaviors that improve the survival and quality of the offspring are, will be favored. This third area is unusually uh, significant for humans compared to other species, as human offspring require so much care. We look after our offspring more than any other species, and so this um, has particularly heavy weight. We can measure the success of all three of these by looking at the uh, production of grandchildren, because that would reflect survival, reproduction, and an individual's ability to rear their offspring effectively. It's important to consider uh, some of the following factors too. Most human evolution occurred in much less modern or technological societies. We need to constantly remind ourselves of that when we consider evolutionary psychology. How does behavior in those contexts 
translate into fitness differences between the behavior and any alternative behaviors. Remember, it's not about happiness or kindness of an individual unless they happen to increase the fitness as well. Behaviors that increase fitness are the ones that would be passed on um, if they have a genetic component to them. We also need to consider how we can use our hypothesis to make testable predictions that would help to either support or refute the hypothesis. So we will consider each of these areas, survival, reproduction and offspring care, in turn. Let's think a little bit more about this context. For most of human history, people lived in small social groups with many relatives in close proximity. There was little formalized, formal centralized authority or law. There were no police. So potentially an individual's reputation mattered more. In modern society, if your reputation is poor, you might be able to move to a new area and start again. But that would have been extremely difficult for individuals in our evolutionary past. So potentially reputation of an individual mattered more. There was also limited contact with outgroup individuals. Different groups would not meet very frequently. And so when meetings occurred, they could be confusing due to poor communication, maybe differences in language, etc. Or violent, maybe even the confusion leading to violence um, between the groups. They wouldn't have had any deep understanding of genetic versus communicable diseases. And so that may also have impacted behavior. Choices or consequences, choices or mistakes that they make might have serious consequences. They would have had more serious consequences than mistakes we tend to make now. With no healthcare system, etc., making the wrong decision would have had a particularly um, poor um, outcome for them, potentially. So first of all, let's think about the evolutionary psychology of survival. We'll talk a little bit, first of all, about the smoke detector principle. Smoke detectors are very sensitive. You might argue they are more sensitive than they need to be in order to detect a fire in a home or workplace. However, it is better to be overly cautious instead of overly daring. In a historical context, evolutionary context, not fearing an animal is worse than fearing a harmless one. So humans would have a tendency to being cautious towards unknown animals. Not staying away from a sick person is worse than avoiding a healthy one. And so we might expect extra caution here. Mismatches between perception and reality can be particularly informative in this context. Humans appear to have an innate desire to create in-groups and out-groups. This is fairly universal around the world, distinguishing between us and them. If we think about the relevant context of our evolutionary history, the modern understanding of disease was absent and they had little contact with other groups. There were lots of risks to contact, misunderstanding, aggression, and, critically, the possibility of disease transmission. So maybe these risks of contact were embedded in our evolutionary psychology. Uh, one way that we can test this uh, was illustrated by uh, Mahajan and Wynne in 2012. Uh, and they asked the question, do pre-linguistic infants prefer similar others? So the way that they conducted uh, this experiment was they had the subject choose between two foods. So the child the, who, who couldn't speak yet would choose between two different snacks. And then they would watch these puppets demonstrate their preferences for the snacks. And then the child would choose which puppet uh, they wanted to play with. So here we have um, the researcher illustrating, um, showing that this puppet really likes this first snack. Okay. And then the puppet goes and it show, looks at the next snack and goes, oh, I don't like that. That doesn't taste very nice to me. And then the second puppet will come along and exhibit the opposite behavior. It will show that they like this snack. 
but they dislike the other snack. And the researcher would verbalize this. And then the child would decide between the two puppets as to which puppet to play with uh, afterwards. So when they ran this experiment, um, they showed that uh, in the high salience experiment, this is the experiment where the child chose the snack first, then watched the puppets and then chose a puppet. The child, by far the majority of the time, chose the puppet that had similar taste to them, that effectively agreed with them and created this in-group. What was very interesting, particularly interesting to me, is that they also conducted a second experiment. In the second experiment, the children first saw the puppet preference, watched the puppet choose one food or the other. Then the child selected the puppet, which one they wanted to play with, and then the child selected their snack. And you can see that in uh, that experiment, there was no significant difference between whether they had chosen a puppet that agreed with their future preference or not. There's all kinds of really interesting studies like this being done at the Infant Cognition Center at Yale University. I really recommend checking out some of their work. Here's another hypothesis. The widespread phobia of snakes is an evolutionary adaptation because snakes are often dangerous and fearing them confers a survival benefit. So here's a photograph of my daughter holding a snake. Um, this, this, uh, this phobia that's quite common, um, uh, this sounds like a reasonable theory to explain why it is common around many different um, cultures, but how do we test this theory? How do we separate it from cultural factors? Fear can depend on evolutionary histories in other animals. Uh, we can see this uh, through a number of different experiments. Uh, when uh, animals are shocked, we can use that to, um, provided with a small electric shock, we can use that to um, test fear conditioning. Garcia and Kohling in 1966 uh, found that rats quickly learn to fear specific odors if they're exposed to an odor and then shocked. But when the scientists repeated the uh, experiment with visual signals, the rats did not learn to fear um, those visual signals as quickly. Wilcoxon et al. Uh, in 1972 did the similar did a very similar experiment, but they with quails, these small birds. They found that the quails quickly learnt to fear visual cues, but not specific odors. And we can see that we can imagine that that would reflect the evolutionary history of these two species, right? Smell is a particularly important sense for rats, um, as they will find that's a, a major method for them finding their food, while birds rely much more extensively on visual cues. So going back to our hypothesis, the widespread phobia of snakes is an evolutionary adaptation. If this is true, we should have more innate fear for old context threats like spiders and snakes than for modern threats. So Oman and Mina in 2001 uh, tested this. They uh, looked and they found that fear conditioning works better for ancient threats such as snakes than for modern ones such as cars and power outlets. What they did was they would show subjects pictures of different objects and every time, let's say for a test subject, they showed them a, an image of a snake, they would give them a small electric shock. They would then see, they would measure the unconscious reaction, the very, very quick unconscious reaction of the individual to seeing that picture of the snake. They would then repeat, they then repeated this experiment with um, the same um, underlying principles, except the individuals would be given a small electric shock whenever they saw something like um, a light switch, a modern threat. And what they found was the ancient threats elicited a faster response, uh, a faster fear response than modern threats, suggesting that there is some weight 
uh, to this hypothesis. Cosmides and Tubi in 2007 uh, also discovered that people are better at detecting old context objects than modern ones. In this experiment, they showed individuals different pictures very quickly. Um, so they would show them a blank screen, then they would show them a, an image, then they would show them a blank screen again, and then they would show them a slightly altered um, image. Then they would show a blank screen again, the original image, going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, until the participant responded with what the difference was between the images. Doing this with lots and lots of different images, they found that people are much better at detecting changes in with old context objects than modern ones. In other words, individuals were much better at, say, spotting whether a person was in an image or a bird or an animal than they were at spotting whether something like a mug was in an image or a vehicle or a new building. Those differences suggest that we do have an innate ability to recognize old context objects and that that might be um, part of our evolutionary history. Let's have a look at another hypothesis. Human bias against foreign, disfigured, or unattractive people was caused by adaptations to avoid communicable diseases. That sounds possible, but how do we test it? How do we separate it from cultural factors? If true, these prejudices that we have against other um, should be increased when the risk from infectious disease is increased. So Faulkner et al. Um, in 2004 did a study on this. They found that when they primed people to be concerned about health issues, when asked about their um, uh, reflections on immigration, they tended to have stronger anti-immigrant attitudes. So this was subconscious. They, the researchers would ask them about things like when they last had a cold. Um, and the subjects did not know that they were being primed. So they were not um, told, for example, you know, are you afraid of immigrants bringing in disease? Instead, they would just ask them some questions about disease and then at a later time, ask them about immigration issues. And they found that when people were primed to think about disease, they had stronger anti-immigrant attitudes um, later on. Uh, Navarat et al. Uh, in 2007, um, did a study uh, asking people um, questions, again, a survey study. And what they found was women who were in their first trimester of pregnancy tended to be more ethnocentric. In other words, they had more racist attitudes. This was unconscious. People were not asked about the, uh, how they felt about their pregnancy um, in regard to um, uh disease. Um, there, was, there was no kind of discussion of disease or anxiety about the um, baby, anything like that. They instead just were um, asking people uh, about their positions on various um, subjects, and they found that it was statistically significant that when women are in their first trimester of pregnancy, they are more um, wary of people different from themselves. That, of course, is a time uh, in uh, a woman's life when she's particularly vulnerable to disease because there's a high chance of the child being um, harmed by the disease. So let's think a bit more about reproduction in the context of evolutionary psychology. We've talked about survival. Let's move on to reproduction. So the context is very important. For males, mating is relatively inexpensive. Males can produce many offspring. Selection to increase the number of partners and the chance of reproduction from each one is what we would expect. The challenge for males is outcompeting other males for those privileges. For females, mating is relatively expensive. Females can produce fewer offspring. So, so we would expect selection to increase the quality of partners and the amount of aid or resources that those partners can provide. The challenge is accurately assessing genetic quality and resource provision of males. Given that wider context, we can start to think about how the evolution of mate selection, etc., could have evolved. 
So we can make some general predictions. Males are more likely to engage in promiscuous behavior, while we would expect females to be more choosy about their partners. There are numerous examples in other species of this being the case. Here we have an elephant seal with one male breeding with many females. And here we have a female bowerbird being very choosy about which male to breed with. And he's trying to impress her by bringing blue objects. There's clear stereotypes amongst humans for this, but we need a more nuanced and human-focused hypothesis. Social errors provide indication of inclination or bias in judgment. A social error is a misconception, may, might be a misconception of sexual interest from a potential partner. Hasselton and Buss in 2000 observed that males overperceive sexual attraction from females, while fem females can underperceive commitment from males. These both play into the bias biases that we had. They had uh, couples, um, they brought people together, males and men and women together, had them hold conversations, and then they completed surveys afterwards. And they found that these misconceptions of the males and females mirrored what we might expect based on our previous assumptions. Uh, Papagno and Carter in 2012 studied uh, mate selection and eye color. They asked, is one eye color preferred? Um, looking at, uh, they also looked at imprinting effects. Do um, people prefer the traits of opposite sex parents? The Westermark effect, do people prefer traits that's different from their relatives? And is there any frequency dependent selection to that people prefer rare or common eye colors? So uh, they had some really interesting results. Their results indicated no significant preference for blue eye color, which was you know, widely perceived that maybe lots of people like blue eye color. Um, there is no uh, significant evidence for imprinting effect. So um, no evidence that people choose other their partner's eye color based on um, their parents. And no evidence for the opposite, the Westermark effect, which is attraction towards different eye colors um, because they may potentially looking for um, different genetics. So if we look across all groups here, we've got females, uh, we've got people of different racial backgrounds, um, we can see there's no significant difference, and for the males as well, there's no significant difference in the attractiveness ratings. However, when we look at frequency dependent selection, within a specific group that was uh, white females, there was a significant selection for rare eye color, not necessarily blue or brown or green, but a selection for what was rare within the community um, that they were in. So this is an interesting thing, and maybe we could come up with some hypotheses as to why this might be the case um, in terms of thinking about um, genetic diversity uh, within uh, European uh, populations populations of European descent, rather. Uh, offspring care, finally, in the context of evolutionary psychology. This is the third area we want to address. As I said before, humans are unusual among animals in the high amount of personal care provided to their offspring. Remember the historical context. It's important to keep that in mind. In the historical context, females spent uh, more energy producing and feeding the young, right, with nine months of pregnancy and providing the young with milk. Males also provided resources for the offspring and their mate in terms of food, protection, and care. Some important things to consider. Males would have had no guarantee that an offspring is theirs. While women would know whether an offspring was theirs or not, males might not necessarily know. Females have no guarantee that their male will stay as a provider. So both males and females are in this kind of vulnerable position. This generates different priorities, and many comparative studies reflect these priorities. For example, studies about jealousy suggest that females tend to focus on the appearance of rival females, while males tend to focus on the social status of rival males.
Infidelity studies suggest that females are more concerned about emotional infidelity than sexual infidelity, while males are more concerned about sexual infidelity than emotional infidelity, potentially reflecting these different priorities. Leng et al. in 2007 uh, studied why do blue-eyed men have a preference for women with the same eye color? There's a general trend amongst um, men with blue eyes. And, and the way that they tested this uh, was they showed men uh, with blue eyes pictures of um, and, and, and lots of different eye colors. They showed um, men pictures of women and they had just manipulated the eye color in each of those images. Um, and they found uh, through lots and lots of repetition and controlling lots of the, uh, the relevant variables that there was this slight preference towards females with blue eye color. So one potential explanation for this is that a male with blue eyes would be able to help to guarantee paternity by looking at the eye color of his offspring if his partner had blue eyes, right? If a male with blue eyes breeds with a female with brown eyes, he can't be certain if the offspring are all his or not, because they could be born with brown eyes or with blue eyes. But an individual with blue eyes who has offspring with a woman with blue eyes is more like it will generally, unless there's a mutation, uh, have offspring with blue eyes. So maybe this is a primitive genetic test, and this is why males have evolved this um, slight preference. Okay, maybe that um, reflects those priorities from earlier. Um, let's look at another hypothesis. Females historically relied on males for resources. Therefore, females should prefer males with resources to provide. Note as well that a male with abundant resources may also, that may also indicate they are of higher genetic quality. Okay, and, and again, remember, think about this in the historical context. So is this preference reflected across cultures? One of the strongest cult cross-cultural patterns in sexual selection is the female preference for males with resources. Gaining resources takes time, so older males tend to have more resources. Um, so as a result, we see um, across cultures that Actually, it tends to be the case that females are younger than their partners and than their male partners. Another strong cross-cultural pattern is male attraction to females around their reproductive peak shortly after puberty. So Fielder and Huber studied this uh, in 2007, looking at offspring count um, with uh, males, first of all, and they were comparing the males and looking at how many um, kids these male had um, based on uh, how uh, much older or younger their female partner was. So looking at this was study was done in Sweden, of uh, Swedish men aged 45 to 55 years old who did not change partner between the birth of their first and last child. So um, here we can see that males who had um, a female partner who was approximately uh, five or six years younger than them, it kind of peaks at around six years younger than them, um, have the most offspring. So this is a fitness uh, advantage. They also looked at uh, a similar study. So Swedish, uh, they also did a similar study with Swedish women aged 45 to 55 who did not change partner between the first birth of their first and last child. So this is for females, and this is where they had an older male partner or younger male partner. And you can see that the female's uh, highest fitness was around four years older. So if we look at the um, comparison between the two, we would expect most um, relationships to be between male and female partners <clears throat> where the male was older than um, the female. And that is reflected uh, in societies around the world. Let's look at uh, another hypothesis. An individual's fitness is not increased by spending resources on a non-biological child. So we would expect parents uh, would provide less care towards adopted kids. 
So this is this is some tough data to look at. So this is called the Cinderella effect, and Martin and Wilson uh, looked at this in 1998. Uh, they looked at um, the Canadian population and uh, the murder rate between uh, 1974 and 1990, and they looked at the murder rate of children under the age of five years old. They found that biological fathers murdered their offspring as a 2.6 deaths per million child years. But by a stepfather, that increased to 321.6 deaths per million child years. So this is obviously deeply tragic, um, but this maybe reflects evolutionary history that this is this staggering difference between the care provided by biological fathers and stepfathers. If we kind of remove um, uh, a, a lot of other variables, and we just look at, say, for example, at um, the murder rate. The costs um, for murdering a biological father, uh, by, sorry, by, by murdering a biological child and by murdering a stepchild are the same, right? You're going to go to prison for the rest of your life, um, and um, you're going to impede your relationship with your family, etc. Um, so it is the same very significant cost in both scenarios, but um, there is a huge difference in terms of biological outcome. And this was actually, the study was reflected around the world. They saw the same patterns in the UK, in Australia, in the US. It's about a hundredfold increase um, by step parents compared to biological parents. Let's look at another one. And these, these are tough uh, hypotheses to, to swallow in terms of thinking about, um, you know, some of the human uh, instincts based on our evolutionary history. But let, let's look at this one. If an individual's offspring differ in quality, extra resources or care should be provided to those with the best chance of producing offspring themselves. As we mentioned earlier, increasing the number of grandchildren. So uh, this was not uh, published in a scientific paper, this work, um, but it was um, done by a scientific researcher and published in the New York Times in 2005 by Harrell. Um, so uh, in Harrell's study, what they did was they observed people uh, with children in supermarkets. And one researcher was rating uh, the child's looks, while another researcher separately was um, observing the adult's attentiveness towards the child. What they found was uh, that when the child was rated cute, the female, both female and male caretakers, tended to use the trolley seatbelt significantly more of the time than if the children were, quote unquote, ugly. Uglier kids were also allowed to wander further from their parents. The researchers counted how many times the child was allowed to move more than 10 feet away from the parent, and they found that uglier children were allowed to wander further. So this potentially supports that hypothesis of preferential care towards um, some children. With all of these hypotheses, it is very, very easy to make up speculative hypotheses, look at data and say, okay, this is this this must be clearly what's happening. But we are not always providing, we're certainly not providing proof, and sometimes we're not even providing strong evidence that um what is, you know, that our hypothesis uh, really is true. It's very easy to come up with them, um, these hypotheses to explain human behaviors. Um, without evidence. Always try to look at primary research with a critical eye. How strong is the evidence? How large is the sample size? How well designed is the experiment? Is it separating cultural factors from innate evolutionary behavior? So here are some conclusions. Evolutionary psychology can be helpful in trying to explain human behaviors. We expect that behaviors that increase fitness would be selected for. It is important to reflect on the historical context in which a behavior may have evolved, rather than a modern context. It is also important to be careful 
when drawing conclusions in evolutionary psychology. Not only do we not have a particularly wonderful understanding of our own evolutionary history and our own, the own things that would have shaped it, but so many different factors coming into play with the co with complexity of human behavior um, can quite easily lead us down the wrong to the wrong conclusions. It is very easy to generate hypotheses, but it can be very difficult to provide strong evidence for these hypotheses. Hence that warning. Hence the need for caution.